Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of Public Opinion with your host, Pam Morton. Normally, I have two participants who discuss and defend their opinion in regard to the public opinion question of the week. But with the holiday coming up and COVID-19 affecting so many of our plans, I thought it was important to discuss how we can take care of our mental health during this time. So join me in welcoming a very special guest, Judy Jackson Winston, who will discuss how we can take care of our mental health during these COVID times. We're going to welcome Judy Jackson Winston, also known as JJ Winston. JJ Winston is a licensed independent social worker and an attorney who for 19 years served as an advocate for individuals and their families who suffer with behavioral health disorders as the client rights officer at the Cuyahoga County Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health Board. JJ Winston is currently employed as a post-decree magistrate for the Honorable Tanya R. Jones, the first elected Black judge in the history of the Cuyahoga County Domestic Relations Court. J.J. Winston is also an author. All right. Thank you so much, J.J. And welcome, welcome, welcome to Public Opinion. I am so happy to have you on this very special episode. Welcome, so welcome. Happy to be here. <laughs> oh, I am too. And you know what? The reason why I thought it was so important to have this particular episode is because of the fact that with COVID-19 and the holidays coming up, a lot of people have had to make a lot of changes to their normal Thanksgiving dinner traditions. Just like myself, I was going to have 30 people and now I'm only going to have two. So I really wanted you to come on the show to talk about mental health and its effects. And I also have a public opinion question because it wouldn't be public opinion if I didn't have a question for you to answer. So I'm going to show you the public opinion question of the week. What effect has COVID-19 had on mental health and what is the best way for people to take care of their mental health during the holidays and beyond? What an exceptional question, Pam. Thank you so much for asking it. You know what? I think that all of our mental health is suffering right now. This has been a really challenging time for us all. Just everything that's happening, having to spend so much time isolated from the people that we love is really difficult. And, you know, it's also people are fearful of COVID. So people are also having mental health issues about, you know, fear of catching COVID, fear of family members catching COVID. I'm going to use myself as an example. Um, my daughter suffers with sickle cell disease, and I've been really fearful, you know, of her getting COVID. So my mental health has been very challenged, just like I think all of our mental health has been challenged during this time. So it is a big deal. Also, I think that, you know, with the holidays coming up, one of the things that we need to also be um, aware of is the holiday blues. A lot of us are dealing with just that. It's not necessarily a mental illness. It is dealing with, you know, depression that comes only around the holidays, you know, because they're people that we love that we are no longer with anymore. So that's even more difficult right now because there are people who are alive, you know, like my mother, your mother, people we want to spend the holidays with, but we're not getting to do that. And that makes us think about past holidays that we had with people that, you know, our family, spending time with them. But what we need to do is tri try to focus on, hopefully we'll be able to eradicate this, this you know, disease, this COVID and being able to look forward to next year to be able to have holidays with, you know, our loved ones, you know, so that's one good thing. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, you know what, well, thank you so much for touching on that because of the fact that this year, I think a lot of people for the very first time are, are going to have very, very different holidays. And I think it's because everybody is trying, who, the people who actually are following the guidelines are, are saying to themselves, is it worth the risk? Is it worth the risk of exposing so many other people? But what do you think and what, do you, what is your suggestion about how people should deal with mental health and, and feelings of depression that surround having to make that decision? 
I think that one way we could probably combat some of the depression that we're feeling is to really spend some time right now with self-care. I think we need to work on trying to, you know, make ourselves feel a little bit better. Really, it is what it is right now in respect to COVID. It's not a lot that we can do about it. What you don't want to be, if you're depressed because you don't get to see your family members, how depressed will you be if you're the one who gives your family member COVID because you don't know you have it and they have really serious dire effects from it. I think that's one of the things that, you know, I've been trying to deal with. I don't, I mean, I don't want to be the weakest link. I don't want to be the person that gives that to one of my relatives, mm -hmm. you know? So it is, like I said, a really difficult time. We should really try to work on some self-care, maybe doing some things like trying to still be connected to your family members and friends. Call them. Mm -hmm. You know what? I think we should bring back the art of writing letters. Yeah. Maybe it's taking the time to write a letter to somebody you haven't talked to in a long time. You know, so that when they get that, the joy on their face to get a letter from you. You know, FaceTime people. Do what we're doing right now. Do a Zoom Zoom talk. Oh, yeah. You know, we got to really try to stay connected. I think that's how you help to, you know, combat depression. I also want to talk about how people who are by themselves, or we got to also realize I'm married, you're married. There are a lot of us who have people who live with us you know, so we're not all by ourselves. There are a lot of people who are spending the holidays all alone. That's why so many people deal with holiday grief anyway, because they're missing people that they love. Oftentimes they're alone and by themselves. And that just reminds them, you know, during the holidays when you don't have any family to spend Thanksgiving with, you know, or spend Christmas with how alone you might really be, or you might really feel. Usually you have friends that you can go and spend time with them, but now with COVID, it's like people have their bubble, you're not in it, you know? So, you know, it is really difficult. I really think it's time that people take this time to reach out to talk with people they haven't spoken to on the holiday, make a plan for how to spend your holiday. Maybe think about three relatives you haven't spoken to by phone. See if you can reach out to them by FaceTime, you know, so that we can stay connected. But also remember those tips like don't drink too much. Don't overeat. You know, if you have depression, the wrong thing you probably shouldn't be doing is drinking. <laughs> because, you know, I may maybe a glass of wine, but if you fall in the bottle, you know, because it's easy to do. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's yeah. easy to do that during this time. If you're dealing with depression, alcohol is a depressant. Yeah. So you might not want to do that. It's just going to probably make you feel worse. You know, yeah. eating too much. You know, it's easy to eat a whole bunch, particularly when you eat that turkey, girl. Now my mama's dressing is so good. Yeah. Okay? And so many people, though, do turn to eating and drinking you know, as a coping mechanism. And I found that during the whole quarantine, a lot of people talked about how much they drank. They became day drinkers, so they didn't have anything else to do right. or they would eat. And um, I know my husband and I, my husband was making banana bread like <laughs> twice a week. And, and so I was eating it because it was nothing else to do. And, I, right. and so at the end of the quarantine, I had to lose, you know, I had to go on a diet and try to lose some of that weight that I gained, but I still try to lose that, that way, girl. Yeah. But I could they see work out with my trainer. I have my trainer. And now <laughs> I'm not I'm not doing it. I'm afraid. Yeah. I know a number of people who've gotten COVID from the gym. And I just want to speak plainly in respect to the impact and effects of COVID on the African American community. It really is hitting us at 2.5 more times, you know, mm -hmm. than our white counterparts. It is a problem. Yeah. And so, you know, this is really scary. I think it's scary times too. But we probably should just try to become educated. Don't spend too much time watching too much news. These are things that can really have a real serious impact on your mental health. If all you're watching is doom and gloom, yeah, it's easy to have a doom and gloom mentality. 
Yeah. You know, sometimes it's better just to look at some fluff and things that just don't make any sense. I think that's why at the beginning of everything, people were drawn to that Tiger King because it was just yeah. so stupid. And, you know, but it, it was a, it was just a, um, a relief, you know, to get away from just looking at all of the doom, like you said, the doom and the gloom. Right. And, um, and like you said, I think I like that idea of of having the Zoom, um, you know, Thanksgiving. I call it a Zoom giving. That's right. Wow. That's a good idea. You know what? If you can, but what we also got to be mindful of is that we live in Cuyahoga County and there is a huge technological divide here. Mm -hmm. Everybody doesn't have access to computers. You know, people have to go to the library to use the computer, but there's still a phone. Almost everybody got a phone. <laughs> I've seen people, homeless people with phones. I mean, I used to work with homeless people and they have phones, some of them. Right. Because we have programs to give people phones. Oh. So what I want us to do is to, yes, we do. So I want people to take advantage of, you know, when they say reach out and touch, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, reach out and touch somebody by call, you know, by calling them. Yeah, that is true. So many people don't even actually talk on the phone anymore. They're so into texting, yes. and, you know, emails. And like you said, I can't even remember the last time I wrote anybody an actual letter letter. Yes, yes. You know, I'm just like, I'll just text you, you know, but, right. and you know, I can remember when I was in college being excited to get letters and cards and things of that nature. But nowadays people just don't even, you're absolutely right. There was an art to it. It, was, right. it was, it was, it was, it was even romantic for people who were dating and, and they would look forward to love letters and things of that nature. Right. And so maybe we should get back to some of the things that we used to do um, that, that we just don't do anymore. And we're not teaching our young people how to communicate in ways that are, we're so far apart. Yeah. And I think that technology is meant to bring us together, but in some ways it makes us far apart. Yeah. But during this time is when you really realize how far apart we are. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is to try to, to create that connection. Yeah. And that's why I think writing a letter, you can't do better than writing a letter, right? Yeah. And, that, and there's an intimacy involved in writing a letter. You know, it's, it is. You know, it's it almost is. like you you put forth an effort. That's of, right. Of actually, first of all, finding a piece of paper or <laughs> That's a card right. or something, <laughs> and then you got to find an ink pen. That's right. And you there's you know, and then you have to actually get a stamp. You know, so there's a lot right. that goes into it. It's purposeful. That's right. You know, it's it's very purposeful, and and you're right. We have lost that. And um, so now, do you have any other suggestions about what- I do have always, girl. You know what? One of the suggestions, like I said, I think that one of the most important things is self-care. Mm -hmm. So I was preparing to speak with you today. I was talking to my daughter, who is a junior in college and home from Ohio State. And she was talking about some of the things she's been doing, because, you know, she was away at college. Mm -hmm. She just got home. Mm -hmm. And it's COVID. And they're not in class the way that they were. And- She's very isolated due to the fact that she has a very serious, you know, issue, underlying issue. So she doesn't want to get COVID. So she loves her friends, but she kept her bubble very small because mm -hmm. she's like, she doesn't know if her friends are going to be following the same guidelines she is, even though she knows they'll probably try, <laughs> you know, so she's, you know, was concerned about that. But some of the things she told me that she's been doing for self-care is we were talking about, you know, how she's trying to be, you know, exercise. We took a walk today at Acacia. That's a good thing. Get some air. Mm -hmm. Go outside. We talked about taking baths. You know, those, you know, taking a nice, long, hot bath. Maybe put some candles. We need to do some more self-care. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. People need to take care of themselves during this time. This is a time to put that extensive grooming in, girl. Get yourself a pedicure. Yeah. You know, you might not be able to go to the, to, you know, get them done. I mean, I like to let other people do my feet too, but if I can't. <laughs> but you know, just get one of those little things, soaking things and That's put right. your feet in it. You're absolutely right. And you know, you know and, and, and people, I, I think people don't spend enough time thinking of, of self-care. Right. You know, and, and, and sometimes I think people think, you know, they're so busy, they're, busy doing other things, but you're absolutely right. You just stop, you know, sometimes right. stop and, 
and meditate maybe. You know? Right, that's right. Meditation mm -hmm. is one of the most important things that you can do during this time and mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Just stop, <laughs> you know, and just focus on your breath. Just breathe. You don't have to do anything extensive. You don't have to go to some class. You don't have to sit in a yoga stance. You can just lay on your couch. <laughs> I lay on my couch, girl. I be in the zone. I also do some of my best creative work when I'm in the zone. Mm. You know, so I think that that's a good thing that people need to do is just take a moment. Yeah, we like can't do anything about what's happening now. Mm. If you are somebody who feels that you are okay, you can go out and you want to help, go and, you know, go to the food bank, help distribute food. It's always good which for your mental health to help somebody else, if you ask me. That's Take your time, give it to the world, do something good for somebody else. We have a, you know, place, the St. Augustine's Church on 14th, West 14th. They serve meals. They need people to drive meals around. Mm. I used to be on the board of Westside Community House. They have a whole community of elderly people who are trying to live in their homes, who need to get a meal on Thanksgiving. Like if you are just bored and you ain't got nothing to do, you don't think you're going to get COVID, you ain't worried, put a mask on and go help somebody. There you go. That'll also make your mental health feel a lot better. You know what you realize when you help other people? You really don't have it as bad as you might think you do. That is so absolutely true. That is so true because you don't have to be confined to your home necessarily. And like you said, if you if you want, you can still help other people. You know, like you said, strap up with your mask or whatever and and put your gloves on, go out there and, and help people and, and do something else and not feel sorry for yourself. That's right. There's always, you know like, always somebody who has it worse than what you have. If you are lonely and you really don't, you know, feel healthy and you feel like you have something to contribute, don't spend Thanksgiving alone because there's a thousand places that can use your service. There's a lot of places that can use your service. I can name a list of places I gave you too. Westside Community House, St. Augustine's Church. Yeah. Um, you got some places, Pam. It's a lot of places. The Salvation Army. We have a lot of places where people who don't have anything, they don't know how they're going to get a Thanksgiving meal. Yes. That would be so happy to have you. Another thing is read. And that's the reason why I got these books right I, here. I, I was just you about to read. say that you are this in all book, <laughs> My book, The Anniversary, I'll put it in the camera. There you go. <laughs> it doesn't have this its finalist badge on it, but I did win. Yes, congratulations. Uh, I'm a finalist in the 2020 Independent Author Network's Book of the Year for the um, Outstanding Women's Fiction category. And so I did, I took my time. That's what I do. That's what I'm going to do with my COVID time. I'm going to write another book. Okay. And did you have a pamphlet that went along with that book? I have a workbook that goes along with, this is the workbook. Okay, now, now just briefly, what is the workbook? Uh, what does that consist of? It consists of reading questions for the book. But what I tried to do is break down a lot of components of mental health. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who go in to get treatment, they really don't understand what's going on. I want you to. I want you to be your best, your own best advocate. The people who work in the mental health system work for you. So when you go in and they say, we're going to do a treatment plan, one of the things this book will teach you, my, my workbook is, when you create the treatment plan, your worker or your therapist or your counselor doesn't create the, the treatment plan for you. You tell them what you want. They work for you. You know, nobody should come in and be like, you know what, Pam? Girl, things ain't going right. So you know what we're going to do? You're going to do this and you're going to do that. You're going to do this. No, you're not. That's People have a right to self-determination. Hmm. So you need to understand your treatment plan. You need to understand what it means to try to reach your goals. Those are things that for you to be able to either be somebody receiving mental health treatment or being that advocate for somebody. Because, you know, a lot of us have relatives who are dealing with this too. Kids, spouses brothers and sisters Absolutely. so you know what 
this book can really help you. It makes you understand what your rights are, but it also helps the family members. Okay. It's always um, an argument. It's always a conflict. You have people sometimes who really do need you to act for them. Yes. We have a duty to our family. You know, people will call me and be going off about me about your family. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important. You're absolutely right. It's important to be able to have people who also can advocate for your mental health. If you That's can. right. And, um, and like my mom, I, I, I have so much respect for her because she takes care of my sister who has mental health issues. And she is 60 years old, 61 actually. And my mother has been taking care of her her whole life. And so, you know, I, I am certainly somebody who is very uh, mindful and sensitive to the fact that there are so many people who suffer, especially during the holidays, right. during the time. And we also had to be very mindful of all of the people who cannot advocate for themselves and just be mindful of everybody else and just take care of our, our own selves. Because if you take care of yourself, then you're a better position to be able to help other people. And that's so true, Pam. And one of the things I really want to point out is that sometimes we're so quick to think the worst of someone. You don't, what my whole book is about, and you did get an opportunity to read it, is that if you were to look at my main character from the outside, it looked like he had everything going on for himself. You don't know what people are dealing with. You only know what people present to you. Right. My mother used to say, what they used to say, uh, something about being a star when you in public you know what i'm saying it's like you know it's not necessarily real you play your position you play your role when you're in public yeah. at home it might be different yeah. and what i'm saying about having a duty is that if you won't let your family member come to your house don't be mad if somebody else don't let them come to their house okay <laughs> you have a duty to your family Yes. You know, you need to stand up for them. And, and when I say that, if you think they're not well, like if you think they're a danger, particularly during this time, mm -hmm. I cannot stress enough that the suicide rates, particularly mm -hmm. for teens, have gone through the roof. Mm -hmm. This is a really serious time for people. Look out for signs of people who might be suicidal. What are some of the signs? When people start talking about death a lot, Mm. that's a really big sign you know I did this really big presentation when I worked at the Adams board for the clergy one of the issues that we dealt with is people go to their religious leaders to seek permission to commit suicide so you want to make sure if you kill yourself you ain't gonna go to hell Goodness. you know what I'm saying so you know people if they're starting to talk about this a lot you know, if they start doing some of the other classic signs, somebody who's giving away all of their belongings, trying to wrap up all of their loose ends. Right. They may need a medical intervention. Yeah. We might need to yeah. commit them for a while to make sure that they stay safe during this time. Absolutely. So we, it's, it's just important. We have to keep our eyes open. We have to be mindful, know the signs and all of those type of things. But more importantly, we have to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of other people. That's well, right. You know what, Judy? I am at the end of my time. But Before you, you go, don't forget my second book, oh. <laughs> The Commemoration. Oh, absolutely. And I started reading that and I'm already like, it's a page turner. So I can honestly vouch for both of those books, the anniversary as well as the commemoration. Yes, and They are you. excellent books about mental health and dealing with family members who have mental health issues. But we have to just be very mindful in this time of year that we have to, to still stay together, but find other ways of being together and other ways of enjoying the holidays. But thank and before you, you so go, Kim, can I just say yeah. one last thing? Yes, you may. If you have anybody that you believe is feeling suicidal, if you see that, if there's a concern, please don't hesitate to call the Marble Crisis Unit, which is ran by Mental Health Services. They may have changed their name. But the number is 623-6888. I just want to make sure I give that information because that is very important during this time. Thank, Thank you. you for so having me. Much. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, that was great. And I think the most important thing that I learned 
is self-care. Self-care is the first step in taking care of our mental health. And even though our holidays are going to look a little bit different this year, we can still get together by way of Zoom, telephone calls, writing letters, and just, just loving each other from afar. So I'll see you next time for another episode of Public Opinion with your host, Pam Morton. And just remember, everybody's entitled to their own opinion.